Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this space. I'm really excited for this session, um, as I've been spending a good couple of months now um, with my head in this space um, in developing the toolkit, which was also, again, a great experience for me. I, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion is a space that is such continual learning, both for those who practice it, but also, you know, for those who, um, <clears throat> who uh, you know, dive in, dive deeply into the the work, and so you know, I, I really enjoyed the process of um, developing this, and and look forward to your feedback and just um, you know, hearing from you as well, and I hope this benefits you where you are at. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of what we have on the agenda for the day. So these are really the, the components of the toolkit. Um, and um, I hope to kind of expand a little bit more in the session today on even some of the things that are included in the toolkit. Um, there's also a really long list of amazing resources that I've included as part of the toolkit that I will be referencing and using in the session as well. Um, I wasn't able to include everything in the toolkit because it's uh, kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of squishing in just sort of the main points for you, but I hope you will dive deeply into the, the additional resources as well that I've shared there. So we will talk about why anti-racism in research is important. Um, we'll talk about the aspects of um, the core principles and the frameworks that are used in this space and in this work. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about inclusive research teams. As you'll see, this is very important as well from an anti-racism and anti-oppression perspective um, for the work itself. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into specific methods and methodologies. I have also tried to do my best in this um, in this work to consider the perspectives of both a sort of uh, 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 STEM field and uh, social sciences and humanities, because I know that there are folks in different spaces of research doing both quantitative and qualitative research too. And there are, you know, a lot of similarities in thinking about anti-racism frameworks in your research um, in those areas, but then there's also very different perspectives as well that you need to consider um, within your methods and methodologies and within the um, data collection and analysis processes. So I've tried to do my best to incorporate both perspectives as well in that. Um, so I hope it will be helpful to you regardless of which field you kind of come from. And then we'll talk about a bit about budgeting too. So some of the things that we can prioritize in budgeting when thinking about our work through an anti-racist lens. And then uh, knowledge dissemination, knowledge translation and mobilization as well. Uh, very important to um, this research, whether you are disseminating research that you do want to make accessible to everyone, um, uh, to, to people from diverse backgrounds and with diverse lived identities, but also, especially if your research incorporates aspects of people's identity, how we actually communicate this information, um, because we know that as well in the process of dissemination, so much harm has been done historically. Um, especially toward racialized individuals. And so we want to be really mindful of some of the things we want to think about when disseminating our research in this way. Now, um, there are many examples. These are just a few um, that I will kind of talk about and probably reference as well um, of research that has included race-based information and really used it in a way that has not, um, that has done harm. Now, um, the, the, the article that you see in the middle, so pulse oxometers, um, what a, uh, a study was done at the University of Michigan in 20, around 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic when sort of everything was going on. But researchers at the University of, Mich of Michigan um, looked at pulse oximeters, which is basically the little clip you put on your finger when you go to the hospital that evaluates your O2 levels and your heart rate, um, which is also oftentimes part of people's plan of care when they're supposed to get a ventilator. Um, and so as you can imagine, during COVID, um, a lot of people were coming into the emergency rooms and this pulse oximeters were being used um, to determine plan of care, who gets a ventilator, who maybe doesn't need it because their readings are okay. And so what they found was that the readings for individual individuals as skin tones darkened were less valid and reliable, which meant actually that the impacts to their plan of care meant that individuals with darker skin tones were not getting ventilators or the readings for their O2 levels were not accurate enough to determine adequate plan of care. And so in many aspects of their care as well, it was undermined in this way. And so, you know, 
obviously thinking about a pulse oximeter, you know, something that gets used worldwide, especially during the pandemic, it was really crucial to the work of healthcare and health equity in this, in, you know, in this sense. And so it really became a health equity issue. And interestingly enough, researchers have known this to be true since the late 90s. So there were studies actually found in the late 90s showing that this was an issue with these pulse oximeters. But unfortunately, because it is an issue of the marginalized, it is an issue of those who are fewer within our society, especially within a North American context where a lot of research is done, these individuals are not prioritized. And so, you know, no one really cared. No one really stopped to say, let's stop using these things or let's figure out a way to fix them. And so in 2020, they were still found to be ineffective. The other two studies that I show here as examples as well are ones where race norming is used um, in uh, concussion testing. So um, if I don't know if you're familiar with um, what sort of happened in the past couple of years where, um, you know, uh, NFL, like uh, football players um, sued the NFL, sued their, their governing body because they found that the NFL was not protecting their players when they were having concussions. So they didn't have, you know, when a player went down with a head injury, they allowed them or made them go back into playing without considering the damage to their brain. And so a lot of NFL players later on in their lives and uh, would um, would actually have early onset Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and so on in their 30s and in their 40s, a disease that we don't see until oftentimes over 40 or over 50 or so in the later years. And so what they found was that it was because of the head traumas that they were experiencing in their sport and because the NFL was not protecting, they did not have adequate protocols. So the players won. They won a huge settlement. And during the settlement, what some of the players found was that they were getting less in the settlement compared to their peers. And what they found it was racially divided. So black players were getting less um, uh, um, less uh, funding from the, the settlement. Um, and they were trying to figure out why this was. Well, what what they found was actually happening was in concussion testing, um, what they do is they assume a baseline for you of what your sort of brain, um, your cognitive functioning is like. And then when you have a concussion, they measure what your, your cognitive functioning is like um, sort of, you know, during your concussion or just after your concussion. And then in order to monitor your progress, um, they you do this test over and over and over. So what this test did was it, uh, the way that the algorithm was created was that it assumed that Black people were of less, um, were of lower cognitive functioning. And so therefore, their baseline was assumed to be lower. So even when a black person and a white person had the same um, uh, result in a concussion test, they would lower the severity for a black person because they would say, well, black people have lower cognitive functioning to begin with anyway. So therefore, their concussion, even though the scores are the same as a white person, cannot be as severe. And so therefore, you know, what would happen basically is where um, a white person would get three months off of sport activity because, you know, their return to sport would be uh, within three months because of the level of concussion that they were found to have. A black person would return within, say, four or five weeks. And so, as you can imagine, the impact of an on an individual having to go back to the sport earlier or being cleared earlier and the trauma that would happen to them. But this was all based in, again, historical understandings um, that occurred in psychology, where psychologists had established, again, through the movement of eugenics, that um, you know Black people had lower cognitive functioning. And so therefore, whenever you use race as a aspect of your research, you need to adapt or adjust for that, which we know, especially in today, that's not true. Race does not determine cognitive functioning, right? Um, what oftentimes also, you know, determines these scores are more likely things like socioeconomic, you know, background, education, and so forth, which are not necessarily determinants of an individual's race, but rather the environment within which they are, um, uh, they have, you know, they 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 live in and their lived experiences and where they come from. And again, too, in our society, being the issue that it is historically as well, we know that Black, Indigenous, and people of color have, um, you know, have been in systems and structures where, um, you know, much racial oppression and, and so forth has occurred in our history. And so we still see the impacts of these in our current society today as well. And research is just one space that we see that in too. Another example here is the retracted article that um, is actually um, one that is um, of 
you know, great interest to myself personally, because I am from South Africa. So it's an article that was published from South Africa. And essentially what this article did was, um, was a group of researchers who did um, work with a, um, a, a marginalized group of women um, again, post-apartheid. So if you know much about apartheid, it was a segregated, uh, South Africa was, um, we lived through segregation until about 1992. Um, so very recent. And so, you know, our social system was essentially based on, um, you know, uh, a, a, a white superior, a white superior system. And so education, access to healthcare, access to jobs and so on, was obviously prioritized for those who were white. And then there was another racial category. Actually, um, South Africa has a three tiered racial system. So it's white and then colored and black. And essentially, as you can see, the closer you are to whiteness, the more privilege you hold. So I'm from South Africa. I was born and raised there. I am um, I grew up as identifying as colored. So I never identified as black, actually living in the context of South Africa because of my background, my cultural background. And so, for example, within our system and structures, the way that it happened was, you know, white people were prioritized. And then, you know, secondary was sort of colored people, you know, the people that I came from. And then black people um, were further marginalized and oppressed. Uh, indigenous black people were further marginalized and oppressed in our society. And so what this study was essentially based on was a group of white female um, researchers who did work on a group of colored women in a highly impoverished, low socioeconomic, um, highly undereducated um, community. And they essentially concluded from their research study that colored women in general have low cognitive functioning and have less aspirations for education um, and betterment in life based on our race. And so, you know, for me listening to that, I have four degrees, I have a PhD, I have two masters, you know, it just makes me be like, well, I don't fit into their racial, you know, the way that they've described my race to be or where I come from supposed to be. And so, as you can see, it's the reason why this study was retracted. But as you can see as well, this study went through, a you know, it went through research ethics review a research ethics board approved it. It went through peer review of an international journal as well and was published in an international journal. And no one stopped to say, this is not okay to put out conclusions like this about a community of color. And um, it was actually only after the community itself went into uproar about this publication that it was retracted by the journal. And so these are just examples of ways that race has been used inappropriately within research that we really need to be mindful of. So I bring to, um, to you the definition that you see here as well um, explained, where race really is a social construct that's used to group people. Race was constructed as a hierarchical human grouping system, generating racial classifications to identify, distinguish, and marginalize some groups across nations, regions, and the world. Race divides human populations into groups, often based on physical appearance, social factors, and cultural backgrounds. And again, to emphasize here that race has nothing to do with our genetic makeup and our biological makeup. It is literally skin deep. Um, I Again, there was um, when researchers developed the human genome, um, where they were able to now genetically compare, um, uh, uh, you know, groups of people or, or people to each other. Um, the three researchers that actually developed and completed the final human genome um, were two researchers of European descent and one of East Asian descent. The individual who was of East Asian descent, Seong Jin Kim, I believe, um, he actually was very interested to see if he compared his human genome makeup to Watson and, um, and now I'm losing the, the name of the other researcher, um, uh, the other European researcher, he wanted to see if he could see genetic differences between himself as being of East Asian descent and the other two of being of European descent. So he did the human genome comparison between the three of them. Interestingly enough, what he found was that he had more similarities genetically with each of his European colleagues individually that they, than they even had with each other. Again, proving the reality that literally race is only skin deep. Race, race really is a social construct. And so when we're 
thinking about race and using race within our research, we need to make sure that that is exactly how we are using it. And this really is the emphasis and sort of the theme, as you'll see, for this entire toolkit, is how do we specifically use race in our research in a way that is appropriate for what race actually is, which is a social construct. Now, anti-racist research approaches um, really holds itself accountable to how race is used in the research design and the process. And there are four key principles to consider in developing anti-racist research. Now, firstly, the researcher must establish their positionality to the concept of race and or the racial groups they wish to include in their research design. Um, the researchers, so in qualitative research, we, we talk a lot about positionality and we ask researchers oftentimes soon, especially if you're working in community, to describe your positionality. Positionality is defined as the notion that personal values, views, and location in time and space influence how one understands the world. Now, I believe that positionality is relevant to both qualitative research, so within qualitative research spaces, but also quantitative research spaces. As you can see from the example I provided, pulse oximetry was designed by engineers. It was algorithms that was done in computer science, right? Um, all of this was sort of developed within a very sort of uh, STEM field, right? But yet there were no researchers in that space that stopped to say, well, can we make sure that the population actually has more diverse individuals that we're testing this on to ensure that it's valid and reliable, regardless of skin tone? Um, no one stopped to say, you know, what was, uh, no, you know, no one in, even in the peer review process stopped to say, oh, how diverse was the population, right? Um, and so, or are there, were there any racial differences that we found? Because it is something that's going through the skin. And so, you know, um, this again shows us the importance too of the positionality of even the researchers doing you know, science, you know, scientific research that is STEM based, but also, as you can imagine, it's very important to qualitative research, because when we are analyzing information that we're collecting in a qualitative way as well, who we are, our background, um, our lived identities, our lived experiences of how we see the world impacts the way we interpret data, the way we interpret information as well. And so a researcher's foreknowledge, their understanding of the world and the biases that they may hold about the environment and the people in it impacts the way that they perceive information and the deductions made from or about the research. <clears throat> Sorry. So, you know, the next uh, factor that I want to uh, bring your attention to is the use of race for um, uh, is the sort of what racial categories that you will be examining. So how the information will be collected and how um, you will actually ensure the privacy and confidentiality and protection from discrimination for participants. The researcher must also clearly describe the relevance of race to the research project and how it will be used within the context of the purpose of the research project. Now, thirdly, within these core principles as well, researchers must be ready to challenge any stereotypes or biases that may emerge in the use of race-based data within the research process and um, avoid making any assumptions about racial groups. This is a huge responsibility, right? Because assumptions based in stereotypes and bias can cause tremendous harm and perpetuate the systemic and structural inequalities that we see happening in our society on a day-to-day -day basis. And lastly, researchers must establish their commitment to doing research with the purpose of social change, especially when you are using um, race-based information. Doing research that only serves the majority, that disregards marginalized minorities, rendering them visibly invisible, and that perpetuates historical harms is no longer acceptable within our research and especially within our Canadian context, where we pride ourselves to be a multicultural um, society um, and also for our research to serve a globally diverse world. Right. So in this final principle here that I mentioned, researchers are committed to examining their research process in ongoing ways and they're willing to sacrifice profit for the greater good of social change and justice. Now there's very specific ways that we can do that. And so the rest of the session today, we will be kind of going through all of these as well. 
I want to remind you as well that if um, at any time you want to ask a question to please feel free to put it into the chat and I will be stopping at the end to, to, um, to go over them. So moving on to inclusive research teams. So again, as I demonstrated to you in the beginning, um, the importance of the diversity of the research team, but it's also important to create an inclusive research team, right? For diversity to thrive, because diversity won't be there if the environment is not inclusive. And sometimes diversity is there, but the environment is also not inclusive. So here are a few ways that you can think about um, inclusivity within your research environment. Firstly, by providing training for everyone, um, you know, uh, using the opportunity to gain access to anti-racism or anti-oppression training that is available at your institution and doing it even as a research team together, you know, as you embark on this process of, of starting your research is a great place to start. Maybe doing it on an ongoing basis. If it's, um, if it's offered annually at your institution, how about saying to your entire research lab, hey, we're all going to sign up for all of these trainings, you know, for the anti-racism, anti-oppression training. And I'd love for everyone to be able to do that as part of our commitment as a research team to this work as well. <clears throat> So, um, you know, some of the other things that we can think about as well is um, uh, co uh, community commitments. So when, you know, if you have a research team committing to ensuring that the environment is going to be anti-racist anti -racist and anti-oppressive. So for example, you know, if you have sort of like a community statement for your lab or, you know, for your research environment, I know I'm going to be talking about labs a lot sometimes and bringing them up in this way, but a lab is not limited to a, uh, a STEM space. I just want to say that a lab can be a field lab. It can be, you know, just an office lab. It can just be a team that, you know, doesn't have a physical space either. It's just an, an you know, a, a group of individuals that come together that to form a research team and that work within that that space, um, whether physically or um, sort of on a virtual space as well. But having community commitments for your lab is also a great way to start. So if you have a statement that everyone kind of commits to and says, we are committed to a anti-racist, anti-oppressive, um, uh, uh, inclusive uh, environment where we will not tolerate language that is racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, and so on, and commit to that. And, you know, maybe post that within the environment that you maybe go in on a daily basis or, or so. And, you know, remind people on the first meeting that you have um, as a team, this is the environment that we are committed to fostering. And we um, strongly believe that everyone is committed to this. And so what that does as well is it creates an inclusive environment, but it also allows for those individuals who are racialized to feel safe in that environment, that they know that if they do have that experience, right, that they can come to the leader and say, you know what, we, you know, we've committed as a lab to this, but, you know, this was said and it was very hurtful to me and very harmful and I, I'm hoping you can address it. And so there's that openness to address the inequities that kind of come along as well. Also, it's a preventative measure, to be honest, because when it's clear for everyone that you're not going to tolerate language or treatment of individuals in an environment in this way, then it creates that sort of proactive, inclusive environment as well. Share with folks as well in the environment the complaints process that exists at your institution. You know, especially as research leaders too, I encourage you to be aware of what that looks like, where they lie, you know, and also share that with your team, with your research team as well. What are your process if you do have a complaint for your faculty, your department, or centrally, right? Um, what's the central office? What is the number? What is the email? Or what, you know, where where is it you can go to if you do have a complaint? And then share that, you know, when again too, especially when you have new members to your research team. You can let everybody know. So, you know, um, we have these, um, you know, uh, these services are offered at our institution. This is where you can access information about it. And if you experience any of these things, harassment and so on, this is where you can go. Um, and also, you know, that it provides accountability, being culturally inclusive as well. That's, you know, it's one of the steps of creating a really um, great anti-oppressive ent um, environment as well. Um, is by welcoming, you know, and being open to accommodating individuals, especially when they have non-Christian Judeo um, holidays or religious holidays, um, and, you know, leaving space for that, putting that in the calendar, right? Putting, you know, it's Yom Kippur, or, you know, this is the month of Ramadan, or, you know, this is a Hindu um, holiday on this day into your team calendar or into your lab calendar somehow, so that everybody knows that that you know, that is a day. And so then you don't schedule events on that day, right? Or you don't schedule a potluck 
during the day in the month of Ramadan or things like that. So, you know, being really inclusive in that way is really um, part of creating an anti-racist um, research environment. Um, leadership really carries um, the responsibility of identifying the social dynamics of power and privilege, both of themselves and their identity in relation to their team members, but also between team members. Now, racialized members who are in the minority may require intentional and meaningful efforts by the leader to bring them into the group. An empathetic leader can set the example of inclusivity and anti-racist behaviors in the team that they are responsible for. Re um, for leaders, I encourage you to reflect on the diversity or lack thereof for the research team and the field when considering hiring for new positions as well or recruiting new team members. Seek to intentionally hire more racialized members if the team is homogenous. Now, this will require a whole lot more efforts, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the budget section, too. But, you know, it might be things like, you know, actually creating a post for a master's position or a PhD position, which we know oftentimes doesn't happen, right? But being intentional about, about it and having a, a recruitment and hiring plan is just one way, right? And then maybe sharing that opportunity with diversity groups in your field. So I know, for example, you know, there's groups and, you know, you'll find them all over Twitter now, you know, like Black and Neuro or Queer and Neuro, or, you know, um, a lot of those kinds of groups that have associations and organizations specific to your field and your area. Find them and share any opportunities that you have with those groups so that they can share it with their networks and you can really diversify your applicant pool. Sharing it on Twitter as well, using those hashtags, right? Um, indigenous in STEM or, you know, um, women in uh, women, you know, women in social sciences or things like that, right? Women in psychology or or so, depending on your area, using hashtags like that will also attract individuals. Um, uh, uh, underrepresented groups um, to your opportunity that you might be sharing in that way. Um, again, cre creating equitable research environments, you know, providing professional opportunities, uh, uh, development opportunities for everyone as well. This is a big one um, as well in developing trainees. So being attentive to providing equal opportunities for professional development and measuring it. You know, one of the examples I give as well in the toolkit is, you know, don't give all the EDI committee work to the racialized folks in your lab. And then the really cool, impactful for your field committee work is done, you know, is given to sort of the, you know, the white trainees in your, in your lab. That's also oftentimes what happens, right? Be very intentional in, 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 in looking at and evaluating the equity within your professional development opportunities that you provide to your trainees. Also, early career research is, of course, you know, just depending on the context. I know I'm going to be speaking a lot to this sort of dynamic as well of the faculty member and the trainees and the trainee program too. But, you know, it, it kind of, you know, it goes for leaders as well, for faculty members, who are, especially those who are early career researchers too. Mentorship is a big one as well, right? Being willing to mentor, and especially if you're an individual with power and privilege, you know, from a dominant group, seeking out opportunities to mentor individuals who are racialized, you know, providing them with those opportunities to share your knowledge with them, that they oftentimes are not within those networks, right? They don't always have those opportunities. Again, affinity bias is this bias that kind of comes in and seeps into academia so much where we kind of choose to surround ourselves with people who look like us and people who culturally reflect us. And oftentimes this is to the exclusion of individuals from underrepresented groups. So be very aware of the mentorship you provide. And I encourage you to, especially if you are from a majority group, to be intentional about your mentorship towards those who are racialized within your um, field. Sponsorship. This is a huge one because I'm going to be honest, professional development and mentorship means nothing without sponsorship. Sponsorship is the reason why we see oftentimes and what I see to be the lack of diversity within faculty bodies, within leadership as well, because sponsorship is where we use our power and privilege and we put it at the forefront to hold space for someone else in front of another individual, right? It's where we provide that trainee with their first job outside of um, finishing their PhD or finishing their master's. It's where we hold them and our reputation and put our reputation on the line for them to be able to get that next opportunity, right? We know this to be true that individuals, especially from underrepresented groups, 
don't always have those sponsorship opportunities that gets you that next step, that gets your foot in the door, that gets you into those spaces of your first faculty position, you know, your first leadership role or so on and what that might be. Um, so be very mindful about how you can use your power and privilege in the spaces that you are to be able to elevate and provide sponsorship opportunities for your trainees and especially those from racialized groups. Examine whom have you sponsored and whom have you not sponsored as a mentor, right? It's great that you probably mentored them, but did you help them get that next opportunity that they may be um, pursuing or would like to, to go to? Just being mindful of time here as well. Um, so moving on to methodologies and methods. So there are really two ways we're going to discuss this. Like I said, I'm really going to try to be mindful of being inclusive of qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers. And so um, the, you'll see that this is sort of how I've sort of split this work into it. It's how my brain kind of works as well and how I uh, develop some of my strategies too. But what I oftentimes find is, is in with quantitative research, we oftentimes use race as a variable you know, that we collect within the work that we do. In uh, qualitative research, it can either be a race variable that we use, if, especially if we're using a diverse population, or it can be a racialized community that we're actually working with, where the entire community and population of our research is racialized. And so there's a lot of considerations that we need to think about for these two ways that we think about race within the research um, methodology and methodologies and methods that we take on. So in thinking about race as a variable, you can think about it as collecting prospective data. So, you know, when you're when you're when you're developing or designing your research study and now you're planning on collecting, you know, race based information, what is that going to look like? So you're going to use a demographic form more than likely. Right. So you either have to develop a demographic form or you're going to take one from somewhere. So I want you to be mindful of that. So when you are collecting prospectively race-based data, so where people have to choose to identify, are you racialized or not? And what is your race? Are you, you know, are you black? Are you South Asian? Are you Southeast Asian? Um, you know, are you white? All of those, you know, those options that we've seen um, with the equity census or, or so, all of those options, where are you getting that, those questions from? And how is it collecting the information that you need for your study specifically as well? And then to around that, you know, what language of race will you use and will it provide the information you need to answer your research question? Um, one of the things I always, I actually just, you know, uh, recently talking to, to a group as well, it's, it's very project specific. And we always encourage researchers as well, don't collect too much information that you don't need because you're overexposing people, but at the same time, understand what you do need for your study and what may potentially be helpful to you in your further analysis, in the dissemination of your results, and in the impact you want to have for your research as well. Now, in thinking about retrospective data, so I know too in quantitative research, sometimes people work with big data sets or old, you know, historical data sets. Think about it, you know, sometimes it includes, you know, uh, race-based data ask and query of the data. How was the data collected? And was the language used appropriate and inclusive? And then two, how was that information collected? And does it give you the information that you can actually use for your, you know, the conclusions you're about to make about how you're going to use that information in your new research study based off that secondary data, right? How it's going to impact that. Because I can tell you if the the, the race-based data was collected in a way that was oppressive or harmful or marginalizing, you are perpetuating that as well in the way that you are now going to be reporting any information you deduce from that historical data. So be very aware of historical data as well, especially race-based data. Now, thinking about the racial, you know, when you're working with a racialized community, you need to think about it as insider, outsider. I strongly encourage you as well. Um, there is a book and I'm looking at it now. I'm, I'm turning my head because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now from, it's Audrey Lord's um, it's A Sister Insider. I strongly encourage you to, to read that book. It's, it's, it's really an amazing book, uh, especially if you are a qualitative researcher um, working, in, working with racialized or marginalized communities as well, thinking about yourself as an insider versus an outsider and the perspectives you bring. And this is great too, whether you are a racialized or a white individual working with racialized communities too, because there really is those two perspectives, who you are, impacts again the work that you're doing, right? So if you're an insider, just a little thing to kind of think about is if you do identify with the racial population that you are studying, 
how will you, um, how will your identity, so your lived experience, your connection to the community as well, impact the research? How will it inform? Be very clear, you know, be transparent about how, you know, your, you know, what you're bringing, your identity is bringing to the work as well. And if you're an outsider, so if you do not identify as part of this community, what is your identity and your identity's power relationship to the racial population that you are working with? And how will you mitigate for power imbalances and personal bias that you may be bringing to this work as well? So it's very important to kind of think about those aspects of it as well. Um, so again, in the... Um, in the kit, you know, we go, I go through a lot of things that you can kind of think about. I'm not going to go through them too expansively here. So I encourage you to, to review the toolkit, but, you know, just a couple of things for you to think about as you go through this that I want to kind of highlight for you here is again, um, you know, one of the most important things, nothing about us without us. If you are especially doing research with um, a, uh, a racialized um, community, make sure that you are doing it with community, not on or over community. That you are either, if you are from the community, right, that you're holding yourself accountable. And especially if you're not from the community, that you have expertise, um, colleagues and peers who are providing you with accountability to ensuring that you are not perpetuating harm um, toward this community as well. So be very mindful about doing this work in this way, right? Um, again, making sure that you're using race as a social construct, not as a genetic or biological variable. Query, ask yourself again and again, what are the conclusions I'm making? Are they deductions from a social perspective? Or are they deductions from a what I'm assuming to be a genetic or biological factor inherent to um, a racialized community? And when I am, you know, bringing up this sort of ideology about a group, is it generalizable to all groups, regardless of the population context or, you know, where, where they may, might be as well. So be very aware of that as well. Okay. Um, so, you know, moving on to data collection and analysis. Again, like I said, I've kind of divided these into collecting race as a variable and, uh, you know, thinking about race as community identity. So we'll go through a couple of these questions here and now as well in thinking about race as a variable. Some of the questions you need to ask yourself is, why are you collecting the race-based data? And is it relevant to your study? Do you need to collect it? And what is the purpose for which you are collecting it as well? Um, will you collect the race-based data as aggregated or disaggregated? So are you going to just ask a question of, are you racialized, yes or no? Or are you going to ask the expansive, disaggregated, you know, um, kind of listing all of the, the, the different ra racial um, groups for people to select from? And then how are you going to use that data? What are you going to do with it? Um, because to be honest, I, I, I say to people as well, if you're not specifically going to see how something impacts black people or Southeast Asian people or West Asian individuals, why are you collecting such, ex, you know, like expansive data? If you just need to know if it impacts racialized versus white people differently, then maybe that's just the question you ask, right? Are you racialized or not? And that might just be all you need to collect. So think about the, you know, the reasons why you're, you're, you're asking these as well. And then, um, you know, in the last point here, are you able to set diversity targets for representation in your research participant pool and change strategies to meet these targets if you are not? You know, one of the things, an example that I came across when I was doing this work as well was I was working with a group who was doing um, work with um, uh, 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 individuals with Alzheimer's. So they were looking at the experiences of um, of caregivers um, of individuals with Alzheimer's. And, you know, it was kind of like an easy relationship or partnership to make. They did it with the Alzheimer's Association, which was great because it, it allowed them, you know, uh, a, a participant pool, um, you know, associated with, um, with, you know, with the target population that they were looking for. But the reality is that a lot of individuals from racialized communities don't engage with the Alzheimer's Association, right, for their care or, or so. They do a lot of their work within their own communities. And so these researchers needed to, yes, connect with the Alzheimer's Association, but they also needed to maybe go to the local mosque and say, do you have a group here that gets together to support 
um, individuals within your community who have Alzheimer's, you know, going to, you know, um, uh, maybe an indigenous group that supports individuals as well with Alzheimer's and saying, you know what, we're doing this study and we really want to be able to be inclusive because we know that this information is going to impact policy that's also maybe going to be adopted for your population, you know, can we work with you to engage with your members as well to, to hear about their experiences of caregiving for individuals with Alzheimer's. And so, you know, one of the things that the results of this research study brought was that everyone as part of the research study was white. It was not a single racialized individual as part of the study. So tell me how generalizable is the caregiving aspects and the policy that we're now develop in Canada for individuals with Alzheimer's and the funding that's supposed to go to those kinds of um, sort of that work and so forth, right? It's informed by a white lens. And so researchers really need to think about that, okay, if I look, I need to look and reflect on the diversity of my population, even when I've collected all of my data, maybe I need to collect more. Maybe I need to put in a new ethics approval to, you know, to increase my end size so that I can have more um, targeted represent, you know, representation within my study. So thinking about taking on such strategies talking about race as community identity. So in thinking about this, when you're working with a racialized community, um, you need to be able to question as well, as part of your data collection and analysis, does the way in which you describe the racialized community align with the way that the community would describe themselves? I know it, it sounds like a simple point, but oftentimes researchers don't think of it like that. Researchers say, no, this is a black community, but they're like, you know, you don't realize that, well, you know, there's mixed individuals who are black too. Do they identify as black or do they identify as mixed race and not black? And what does that mean for your research then? And how is that going to impact it? So you, as a researcher, especially when you're working with a racialized community, make sure you're defining your community and your research the way that the community actually defines themselves. Um, and then, you know, how does diversity within the racialized community impact your data collection and outcomes? There is diversity within diversity within diversity, right? There is no, you know, even when we talk about a group, I, you know, in, in my lived experience, my identity, I'm a black identifying woman, um, you know, cisgendered, but I cannot represent every black woman who is cisgendered, right? There's just no way that my experience can inform every experience of a woman who self-identifies like myself. And so understand that there's diversity within diversity within diversity. Um, and then be again to, you know, one of the things that you'll see again too is a theme throughout this toolkit is, are you looking to confirm a stereotype or bias about a racialized community through your data collection and analysis process? Something that we call confirmation bias. So if you're coming with a certain ideology about a group, which is the example of the South African study that I showed you, they already knew that you know the the women from this group that they were going to be studying had lower education had you know were in within lower socioeconomic status had a lack of opportunities and access to so many things they decided to study them anyway and to conclude something but then want to have it generalized to everyone in that race Right. And so they were really they took their confirmation bias and then did a study within confirmation bias set into it. Right. So be aware that you're not asking a question that already through an anti-racist, anti-oppressive framework, we can answer that question for you, you know. Um, so, again, just, you know, last couple points here when it comes to data collection and analysis. One of the most important ones I'm going to kind of point out here is, do you have the skills to analyze the data from racialized communities in a way that does not perpetuate oppression, deficit thinking, or stereotypes about the racialized group? Because that very analysis, again, data is not objective. It is not. Even again, too, within the most, you know, STEM of STEM fields, data is not objective. It still depends on whose gaze, whose lens, and what perspectives are being um, questioned of the data that can perpetuate harm if the lens is not done through an anti-oppressive, anti-racist lens. Thinking about budgeting. So again, just going to touch on a couple here because I see we have 10 minutes left. But, you know, very important to your budget is building relationships with a community before the research grant is even developed and develop the research question with the community. That is key, whether you are doing a, again, like I said, a uh, quantitative or qualitative study. Again, this is very important to qualitative, but I would say even quantitative. If you know you're going to be collecting race-based data, 
build relationships with the expertise that you need to be able to um to 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 have the expertise that you need for the lens of this work as well and then you know in thinking again to about um an anti-racist budget be prepared to um, use the budget to pay for things um, that are oftentimes outside of what I would call sort of the traditional historic white research, right? Because in order to be more inclusive and for your research to be more diverse, you're going to have to ha take on decolonial practices that takes more time, more effort, and more money. And so be prepared to include within your budget things like, you know, money for engagement over food with these communities, right? Or hiring consultants as experts to give you that lens on the work, especially if you, you know, if you don't have a research team member that has that expertise um, to give you that, that, that feedback on, you know, the collection of race-based data or so. So be prepared for those kinds of things as well. Now, in thinking about dissemination, which I will close off on, you know, three of the key things to dissemination to remember, I think, is responsibility, accountability, and transparency, right? And so here are a couple of ways that you can kind of think about it is, is transparency and clarity uh, for the process for disaggregated data. Explain, 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 expand, 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 especially if you're using race-based data, because people need to know how you um, uh, collected this information, and it needs to be reproducible as well. And be prepared to correct or hold accountable reporting entities, right? So if you're sharing your work now, say, with a media organization, review that report that they're doing on your research, that they're not taking from your work and misinterpreting, especially race-based information that then, you know, perpetuates this, the stereotypes and the biases that we see within media toward individuals from racialized groups. So you actually have the responsibility to hold these entities accountable for the work that you reproduce and how your work is then, re, you know, re, reshared and disseminated in this way as well. Open access, again, is often is always a, a better practice to go with. Um, one of the most important things as well to think about is when you're working with racialized community is to go back into community to share. You have a responsibility to go back to those communities to also, before you even disseminate to larger, you know, to publish, like before you publish, before you develop your tools that you're, you know, from the information that you've collected, to ensure that the racialized communities that you worked with have had an opportunity to provide you with feedback and have provided a secondary consent almost for you now to disseminate that work. Um, I know oftentimes our processes and procedures within this sort of colonial historic, you know, colonially historical frameworks uh, doesn't hold us account, does not hold us accountable to go back to community and to, 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 to sort of do a member checking with them. But I strongly encourage you to take on that responsibility to ensure that you do do that. And so I want to thank you, everyone. Um, that is the end of the presentation. Um, it has been, like I said, a pleasure. Royal Roads, I, I really just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity that I had to be able to do this with you. And um, yeah, I will now take questions.